Um, what I've done here now is I don't make any recommendations. Just anything that anybody does. What I will supply you with is hard data and practice on my observations. And it's up to you guys whether you want to use them in your business or not. What I can say is that we've run a commercial operation of about 1,500 hives in California, uh, commercial almond pollination and queen production. We sell about 1,000 nucleus colonies uh, every spring to other beekeepers. And we haven't used a synthetic miticide in uh, over 21 years now and are successful at it. So, um, uh, uh, just based upon our experience, I'm going to show you what, our, what we've learned from this. So beekeeping used to be uh, much easier. This is how I started out back in the old days, where you just order some bees through the mail, put them in a box, and it was very easy. It's, it's more difficult now. We've all been this, through this pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic. And, um, yeah, of course. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, you're good. Enough. Okay. So this virus affects humans. Varroa that arrived kicked off another virus pandemic in the honeybee. And there's a virus called deformed wing virus (DWV). It's normally a relatively benign virus. Bees already had it. It's a common insect virus, and it never caused that many problems with the uh, the honeybees. Uh, um, and it can be transmitted via the egg uh, shell on the outside or by the nurse bees. And when the uh, larval bee chews through the egg corium to emerge, um, it can get infected by deformed virus at that time. If that larva is well fed with good nutrition, it normally is a benign virus in that, um, in that bee. <clears throat> but then some variants evolved very quickly. Dr. Stephen Martin is showing uh, an illustration from Hawaii. From Hawaii. Within a few years, uh, there's very strong selective pressure for certain variants, just as there is with COVID. And uh, the deformed wing virus A variant became very uh, common uh, within the bees. <clears throat> and it learned to use this mite as a vector. Now, you don't necessarily these days see that many deformed wings on the adult bees. That's from a very severe uh, virus infection. And they, they do what's called counts, you know. How many um, uh, they do it in exponential? So 10 to the 11, so that's 100 billion virus particles, would be a serious infection where you see um, deformed wings. Typically, it's about 10 to the 8, which is um, what, 100 million um, uh, virus particles. Uh, it's typical in a worker bee, and you don't see uh, any sign of deformed wings, and that bee lives fairly normally. <coughs> When it gets up to a very high infestation rate, then you start to see the brood beginning to die. So the brood is dying from virus in, in infections here. And you may see some workers with deformed wings. And then what we get, what we get what we call parasitic mite syndrome in the United States, where you start to see your, your larvae and pupae dying wholesale from uh, virus infection here. And finally, we have your deformed wing collapse with a telltale sign of these fecal deposits in the tops of many of these cells afterwards. Um, but Varroa didn't kill this colony. The virus killed this colony. And that's the thing to keep in mind right here. That when you have an epidemic, you often can control the epidemic by controlling the vector of the pathogen rather than trying to control the pathogen itself. So I've also worked with mosquitoes and um, um, uh, uh, yellow fever and dengue uh, virus. Um, you can simply, when you have a, a mosquito transmitted uh, disease or uh, uh, infection, what you can do is by eliminating the vector, controlling the mosquitoes, then you can control the disease prevalence in the human population. And what we do in beekeeping is the same thing. For us, it's all about controlling the vector of the deformed wing virus, which is the viroma. You can see right here, uh, the, the mites per 100 bees uh, uh, would be this right here, this uh, red on the on this scale right here. And this is the prevalence of highly infected workers by the by, by various viruses right here. And as you can see, over the course of the season, as the uh, uh, the infestation rate due to varroa goes up, it's tracked exactly with the paralytic viruses and with deformed wing virus. 
As long as you can keep your infestation rate of the pest to this low level, just at the low percentage level, then the virus has never become a serious issue. And this is the main thing that we have learned in our management. We keep our mind level low all season long. We don't wait until it comes up and then bring it down. We never allow Varroa to climb. <coughs> So let's talk about managing the mite. First thing, realize, look at the size of this parasite relative to the body size of the host. That's like having a big crab on your body, punching a hole in your body that would be two to three centimeters across, infected with bacteria, and digesting your uh, internal uh, fluids there. So this is the integrated uh, pest management pyramid for varroa mite, or for any kind of pest. You typically start with uh, biologically resistant stock. We do this with many animal and plant species. And then you move up this pyramid. <clears throat> in most all countries where Varroa has invaded, everybody, the beekeepers skipped all these steps and went straight to the top, the synthetic mitocides. And we still are laboring after many decades with Varroa still being a problem. In South Africa, they didn't do that. They stuck with the bottom and they allowed evolution to pay its course. And within six years, Varroa is not even considered a problem in South Africa. Every colony has Varroa. But if you read the literature or go to a, uh, um, a conference in uh, South Africa, Varroa is often never even mentioned at all. It's just, it's there, but it's not considered to be a problem. We have, we have prolonged our agony with Varroa by jumping right up to the top of this pyramid rather than focusing on the bottom. The point is, eventually we're all going to be keeping, maybe not in my lifetime, but maybe in Rose's lifetime here, we'll all have, um, oh, you can't see, Rose is my assistant, much younger than me. Um, we uh, may all be keeping uh, my resistant stock, and I'll be talking later about that. We're in a very strong selective breeding program for grower resistance and showing uh, good progress on that. Uh, we have a uh, significant percentage of our colonies that need zero mite control whatsoever. They're just wonderful uh, colonies. So this selective breeding is both going to go. Okay, let's see, eventually go. The interesting thing is bees can come up with all kinds of different ways to hide the mite. So in my breeding program, which I'll describe more, we don't tell them how to do the job. We, we just tell them what the job description is. One of the things to understand is you, it's not necessary to kill a single mite. Now, as much as beekeepers love to see dead varroa mites on the a sticky board, you don't have to kill a single mite to completely control varroa. All you need to do is to have their, their fitness, their, their um, uh, rate of reproduction. How am I doing back here for the translators? Good. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the simplest method for selection for resistance is, was defined way back in 1999 by John Harper and Jeff Paris. to simply compare the growth of mite populations. And that's what we do in, in our program. And I have, we are walking the walk a demonstration project for the commercial queen producers in the United States on how we do this. And I thought I had taken all these pictures out of this presentation. So this is because I'm going to show this tomorrow. Okay, let's just skip off through all those. Okay, let's move ahead to understanding varroa population uh, increase and decrease. When you see sealed root, we also call that varroa food. That is where mite reproduction is taking place when you see sealed root. So the more sealed root, the more varroa will be reproducing. Now, what I did here is I did a, um, uh, a projection here. This would be the number of months, and this would be the full increase, so 10 times as many, 20 times as many, 30 times as many, in the mite population while they are rearing brood here. <clears throat> so if you have six months, and in, in, in this, I <coughs> type in the number of months they're rearing brood over the course of the year, six months they're going to come up to about 50 times as many. So if you have to start with one mite, six months later you're going to have 50 times as many mites in that column. If you start with 10 mites, you're going to have 500 times as many mites. And then once brood rearing ceases, if we go into a dearth or a winter when they no longer are rearing brood, the mice start dying, but at a lower rate of attrition, maybe a half a percent per day. So it slowly starts to go down. And <clears throat> the colony may survive one year, but you're starting out the next year at this higher rate, and it won't usually survive the uh, second year. 
So this is to compare. When I speak up to, up like in Canada to the beekeepers, and they say, oh God, how do we manage Varroa? I laugh and I say, manage Varroa? Where you live with six months of winter? It's easy compared to California. So look at the can change. With six months of brood brewing, the brew mite comes up a little bit, maybe 50 times, but then it drops down quite a bit. If you live a little further south, you have eight months of brood brewing, now you're getting up here to 200 times as many mites to deal with. If you got 10 months of brood brewing, that would be how it used to be 20 years ago at my place. Um, it gets way up here, now you're talking 700 times as many mites, and nowadays on our warm winters where you have 12 months of brood brewing, it's off the scale. So he takes a lot more mite management if you have as, as longer, longer uh, seasons and shorter winters. We'll talk about that uh, tomorrow. And I, with my sons, look at here. So this is winter temperatures average for the state of California from 1895 until 2020 right here. And I told my sons, man, is it just getting warmer here in the state or am I just getting older? So here is the regression line, line over my lifespan, and you can see the trend definitely it is getting warmer at a fairly rapid clip right there. Oh, I can't open this up. Um, okay, we'll try to get my computer up uh, later, and I'll show you how. This is a model I have online, it's a free download. If you have Excel, very easy to use to set, uh, determine your own management strategy for managing Varroa. And you can kill 100 colonies a night, and it doesn't cost you anything. So you figure out a management strategy that works as for your environment and your operation and your goals. Totally customizable. This is used by beekeepers all over the world. Uh, any of you uh, use this model in your operations? OK. One person. Did I use it? Was it useful for you? Yeah. yeah. Everybody who uses it says, wow. This just changed my management entirely. Now I have a much more successful program. Those who adopt, who have used this, write to me and say, wow, all of a sudden now we, we're not losing so many colonies. So you can use this model, and what it does, it, it, it shows you, for you type in where you are keeping these. So this is a default colony in a temperate climate managed to prevent swarming with a slight fall you would build up. So you can click in or customize for any area of the world. And if you're in the southern hemisphere, you just type an X here and it converts all the dates for the southern hemisphere. Again, download, free download. This shows you your total population of adult bees in the hive. This shows you the amount of sealed brood in the hive on the scale. And the red area is the percentage of brood that has a mite in, in it. This shows your total mite population in the blue. And this would be your mite wash count if you took a half a cup, 125 milliliters of adult bees. And wash the mice off of what number would be. And you try to come up with simulations where you don't see this crash indicator. All you do is you put in these yellow uh, cells a mite treatment. So here we're going to put in the mite treatment right here that has an 80% reduction of the mites. And here we have put one in that had a 95% reduction of the mites. And you can see you started with 100 mites right here. I figure you can put in whatever is appropriate. You ended up with Oh, about 300 mites. So this would get your box for one year, and if you split your colonies three three ways the next spring, it would be sustainable. Otherwise, you're going to have to add another treatment or a more a higher efficacy treatment. If you don't have Excel on your computer, uh, Trish Harness worked for two years to come up with an online model that you can run on your cell phone. It's not as customizable. But you can just go to chickenbuzz.com, and this is also a free download um, to get a model to, to use. And the menu works much the same way, just not anywhere near as, as customizable. So the concept, so I'm going to focus on just telling you concepts in raw management rather than what to do. First one is the number of treatments per year is dependent upon how many months you're brewing brood. If you have an area with an uh, extended winter root break, uh, two treatments per year will often get you by. You start with 50 mice here, and then with 57 mice here, so that would be sustainable. The timing of the treatments also means something. This would be for a Mediterranean area. Notice how the colony population and the root shifts uh, compared to going back to our, uh, for a, uh, a longer winter area. And you would take typically three treatments 
per year. If you were a almond pollinator in California, it's going to take you at least four treatments with anywhere 90% reduction here, a light form of treatment, 50% reduction in the mite level, 95% and 90% here with uh, our solid dribble later on. This would be sustainable. I'll start with 50 mice and the 28 mice. Uh, um, and this, this is pretty close to what we use in our operation right here. Okay, so now understand uh, exponential growth of the mice. That the more mice there in, are in a hot at the start, the faster their absolute uh, rate of increase. Now, there's two kinds of rates of increase I'm going to talk about. The absolute rate, which is the numbers of mice, and then in a minute we'll get to the relative rate success per female uh, mice. So I did uh, five simulations right here. Uh, you're starting with your mite count at the beginning of the, <laughs> at month zero would be whenever you start having brood burning. I started with either 10 mites in the hive, 25 up to 150 mites in the hive. And you notice if you only start with 10 mites, now um, it's not a problem. You never get up to a very high level um, of mites. But look at the slope, the rate of increase. All of these curves are identical. The thing is, they start going to this, what looks like this more vertical, sooner in the season. If you start with a lower, a higher mite count, this is a really important concept to understand. The higher your starting count, the more steep this curve gets uh, sooner. So the point is, it's way better for colony health and colony productivity. And by productivity, you're going to make more honey. And I've done tens of thousands of mite wash counts in my breeding program. So I see with my eyes, day after day, how the colonies are, are performing relative to their parole mite counts. And one thing is this, when the mite counts start to go up, colony performance drops off. They stop being as productive, stop being as successful in a rearing brood. So the, the point is, it's better for colony health and productivity to just keep mite levels low all season rather than trying to bring them up. Yeah. So this would be with three uh, low, low efficiency. I only have 80% efficiency treatments, which are not very strong, but in this case, that gets them down fairly low. <coughs> and because those colonies are more productive. Next concept. You get more bang for your buck with mite control by controlling the mites prior to swarm season. And the reason is, is that the mites have a fixed number of 12 days in the post-capping period, while the cells are capped, the pupae are capped, that's fixed, that's always going to be the same. But then the mites come out and they go into what's commonly called the phoretic or the dispersal phase, where they need to develop their ovaries, allow the sperm to mature in their bodies, and um, feed upon uh, the fat bodies of nurses in order to get enough telogenin to, to develop an egg, and they have an egg ready to go. And that can be as little as, well, a couple of days. It could be two days, although the sperm would not be mature, but it'll still work. Or it could be 10 or 15 days. So the earlier in the season, uh, as the more brood there is relative to adult bees in the hive, the less time the mite is typically forever. So what I did right, right here, is this shows from January through December in a typical uh, uh, climate, a temperate climate. This would be your average reproductive rate, your, your, uh, your instantaneous R value of reproductive success for a female mite. So when there's no brood, it's down to zero starting in January and in December. There's, there's no reproduction. It starts to pick up as so you get a little bit of brood, but it peaks right at swarm season. That is when a colony typically has the highest proportion of eight-day-old larvae, which are being capped over, which is where the mites enter the cells, relative to the amount of adult bees in the, in the hive. So this is the weak spot right here. Our, this is when we'll allow Varroa to get ahead of them, and the mistake that most beekeepers make. They don't have the mites controlled at, at this point where they are reproducing at their highest biological rate. So the point is, nip the infestation in the bud. 
not the mice bat very, very early in the season. How am I doing? Am I going too fast for you guys? Are you, are you good with some of them? Yeah. Okay. It's a lot of, I do information dense presentations. It's the feedback I get. There's a lot of just information going out there. I don't want to feed it to you too fast that you can't come to the room. So this would be a react beekeeper down here. Let's the mite population build up. Goes, oh boy, better put in the mite treatment, bring them down. It's too late. You've already missed your opportunity to prevent an epidemic of the virus. The virus epidemic has already started, and your colony will probably collapse. Even if you think the mites down to zero, the colony will probably collapse going into the winter. On the other hand, the proactive beekeeper here nipped it in the bud, and the mite population never got up there. This is a friend of mine, a hyphen, very large California coal producer. And I, I picked up this quote from him. He did a presentation. He said, I'm not treating for Varroa because I have high levels of mice. I'm treating because I don't want to have high levels of mice. He's being proactive, controlling the mice before they need to be controlled. <clears throat> okay. So let's move up the uh, integrated pest management pyramid, pyramid now to physical, mechanical, and biotechnical uh, methods. Now, if you go, the biggest problem for beekeepers nowadays is this thing called the internet, which means you're going to hear a million conflicting opinions and pieces of advice from people on the internet. The best piece of advice I could give you is stay off the internet. Okay? Okay. Because you're just going to be confused. This lady, Dean loves me. Um, big following among the organic uh, beekeepers. And this is a picture I took when I visited her some years ago. Um, and she started this small cell thing. Because Dee Lovely was in the Nile, where she was keeping bees in the state of Arizona. The Africanized bees arrived and displaced all the European bees. And Dee refused to acknowledge that she had Africanized bees. She called them small bees. And she noticed that the Africanized bees, or small bees, built smaller cells. And she attributed her mind control, their mind control, to the small cells rather than the fact that she was keeping Africanized bees. All you had to do was just visit her, and it was pretty damn obvious they were Africanized bees. They were not European bees, but she was in denial about that. So a small cell, uh, uh, none of the studies showed that it, it helps. You know, here on the internet, allowing your colonies to swarm. Uh, Mind you know, and issue deal. What's that? Oh. Uh, allowing your colonies to swarm. Allowing your colonies to swarm only reduces the mite population by about 30%. Um, right? And what it does, it leaves 70% of the mites in a smaller colony. So now your mite infestation rate is even higher relative to the number of remaining bees. And it's really tough for those bees. The other thing is, if you allow your colonies to swarm, now you're putting out not only more competitive colonies out into the trees out there, but you're creating a bunch of mite factories that are going to be loading your hives back up with varroa. The last thing in the world we want in our operation is to allow the colony to swarm. So we try to avoid swarming at all costs. Screen bottom boards. I was one of the first adopters of screen bottom boards. We built 500 of them, put them into our colonies. They're really great with the sticky board. I use them in research, but we have not found them to be that beneficial as far as mite uh, management. Uh, drone trapping. That also helps a bit. We run a drone frame in every single one of our colonies. Initially, we thought it was going to help with Varroa. We found out later um, we don't use them for Varroa control. We use them for managing our drones. Um, but mainly because if you have you give the bees a drone comb, they don't build drone comb on the worker uh, frames. And since we sell a thousand nukes, we can sell beautiful combs of worker brood with no drone cells in them because they give the bees a place to uh, put their drone cells. So it will reduce the mite population and make me put it into my model. It's, it's got a place for it there, but uh, I won't count on it. Sugar dusting. I probably dusted more powdered sugar than any other beekeeper on the planet and collected data on this. And if you are diligent and you want to do it twice a week, 
Yes, you can control mice with sugar dusting, but most beekeepers get tired of sugar dusting uh, after the first few weeks. And you have to have a low humidity to have it work very well. So it can work, especially if you have a low humidity environment, but it takes a lot of work. And then uh, thermal treatment. Uh, it's a plausible method. It, it is proven it can work, but it's a very, the, the thermal tolerance of varroa and honeybees is a very narrow spot really hard to get just hot enough to really control the mite without hurting the bees. Um, there are some methods that work, but it's very labor intensive, relatively slow. I'll be actually, I'm setting up a trial for this summer to test uh, an invention by an by a Italian beekeeper who has a um, thermal treated uh, combs, and we'll get hard <coughs> on, on that. When I have actually tested it, I found that there, that there's a fairly high survival of the mice within the sealed brood, and uh, um, they, were, they, they were not sterilized at all and were able to rapidly resume uh, reproduction. The thing that we found in our operation that is most effective of anything is the biotechnical method of splitting your colonies in the springtime before they swarm using queen cells rather than making queens. By using a queen cell, you create an induced brood break because it takes uh, a while for that queen to emerge and mate up. So you're, you you start off on day one when you make it, or day zero when you make it, and the um, uh, you have some brood in the colony. By 21 days later, all that brood has emerged. The new queen from the cell, she doesn't start laying until about here, get new larvae, and none of those, those larvae are old enough to have a mite enter until about here, about day 19. So if at day, you start with the new, with a queen cell, right queen cell, we, and not dead right, we usually start with about uh, 10 day queen cells. Um, at that day 19, you just give the colony a dribble with oxalic acid, and you eliminate virtually all the mites. It takes you just a few seconds. With a fire paper nuke, it takes, it takes you five seconds. It costs you a few pennies. And you start, we start our entire operation every year with essentially mite-free um, nucleus colonies that take us almost no time to do. It's really simple. We've done this for, for almost yeah, over 20 years. And this starts off all of our colonies with new queens, fresh, um, and almost no mites. And it, this, this is the, the, the biotechnical method that we have found to be by far the most effective. Yeah, they, we usually do it depending on the temperature. If it's warmer, we'll do it like day 18. And this is our number one thing on our calendar every day. What we run about 50 different out apiaries of bees. So when we get up in the morning, we don't do any of them need their oxalic acid dribble that day. And that's our number one priority. We're starting off with mite free to make sure those colonies get their dribble on the right day. We can't wait. Now for hobbyists, you can simply do root separation if you have time. <laughs> And this is on my website on first year beekeeping, but I'm going to elaborate it. But you can split a colony in two, put the laying the um, original queen uh, with, with in, a, in the with the combs of only open brood but no sealed brood. Put all the sealed brood in the nurse bees in the other half and give them a queen cell. And you treat this one with oxalic acid dribble immediately, and this one you do at day 19. Now you wind up with two colonies, a fresh queen, one with a fresh queen, one with an old queen, and at that point you can decide what to do. If you want to make a bunch of honey, put them back together. Let the young queen replace the old queen, but now you have a strong, one combined strong micro colony, or you can sell or make increase with the other one. So this this is a works very well. Okay, let's move up the pyramid some more. <coughs> Monitoring the mic levels. My suggestion is don't ever take your eyes off the bird off. You want to monitor your mic level all the time. You can't rely on visual inspection. By the time you start seeing mites on the upper side of the bees, it's way too late. The vast majority of mites will be on the underside of the bees. So when you start seeing on the upper side, you've already missed, missed the boat. It's, it's too late. The mites are already out of control. The other thing is that you got to look at percentage of the mice that are in the brood. And on my model, it will calculate right down here every month what percentage of the mice are in the brood. 
Notice that at storm season, we're up to about 80% of the mites are in the root. That means only 20% are on the adult bees. So if, if you are evaluating either by a mite wash or a visual uh, at storm season, you're not going to see very many mites, even though your colony is chock full of mites, because the vast majority are in the root at that time, because, because of the propor relative proportion of eight-day-old larvae to adult bees. <laughs> Later in the season, typically you have 50 to 60 percent of the mites are in, in the root. So keep this in mind with your mite treatments, and that's why the model will show you for every time period what proportion of mites you expect to be in the root and what proportion will be out on the adult bees. That helps you decide which treatments will be efficacious at that time. You can do sticky board counts. The sticky board counts mainly reflect the number of mites that are dying of old age or are emerging from the brood, newly emerged mites dropping out. It's, so it's very erratic. This, these counts can vary day to day by a factor of three, whereas with a, a, a mite wash, uh, there's very little variation on that. It's also time consuming. We can use at least two trips um, out, one to put the board in and one to take it out. I don't know if you hear, many countries people use the sugar roll. Um, and interesting, if you read the, the, the explanation for why this works from the universities, they say, oh, you put the sugar on, you turn it, <clears throat> you let, let it sit there for a minute, and the bees will heat up because they're irritated. The heating of the bees will make the mites release. And when I wrote to the original researcher, they said, oh, can I see the data on that, the temperature data? Uh, they said, oh, well, Randy, we never took any actual temperature data, and that's kind of what we figured was happening. So I did take temperature data, and they don't heat up at all. That was just somebody just making that up. So it's out there, recommendations for everything, but the temperature doesn't go up. When I have, oh, I don't have it here. I have uh, another, I cut out a bunch of slides out of this to keep the presentation short enough for us here. I have data showing what your actual recovery is with sugar shakes, and it can be as low as 50% of, of the mites. So as far as a reliable method, um, it, you don't, a lot of variability, so I, I, we don't use sugar shake in our operation at all. What we have found that works really well is a wash of mites. We used to use alcohol, and the typical recommendation is 70% alcohol. If you, on my website, there's, I've got whole articles of massive amounts of data where we washed bees with 50% alcohol, 70% alcohol, 90% alcohol. You, you want to use 90% alcohol. You get much better recovery with 90% alcohol. And then we try a bunch of other solvents. Again, all this information is on my website. And what we found was the best recovery we get is with Dawn detergent. Now, Dawn detergent is a high surfactant detergent uh, for hand washing dishes, and it makes a lot of bubbles. So if you are a bubble blower, you want to do tricks with making blowing bubbles, you always use Dawn detergent because it makes the biggest bubbles, okay? When I, I tested a number of different detergents, only the detergents that don't make bubbles, like for automatic dishwashers, they don't work. <laughs> They're getting the mites off. Only detergents that make a lot of bubbles will get the mites off. So I don't know if you have Dawn brand available here, but if not, you want, you want a detergent that makes lots of lots of bubbles. <clears throat> the second thing is, people say, shake, shake them up and down. Well, every time you shake them up, you stir all the mites back up into the bees. That's the last thing you want to do. I, I, I come from the gold country in California, where you pan gold. What you're doing is you are have gravel of a certain density and gold of a higher density, similar to mites and honeybees. The mites are slightly more dense than any of these. And if you want to separate the gold from the, from the gravel, you don't shake it up and down, because you keep stirring it up. You swirl it around and around in the gold pan, and the gold will precipitate down. No vertical action at all, only swirling action. Same thing with a mite wash. Do not shake them up and down. With the dawn detergent, you don't need any physical agitation to release the mites from the bees. You can just put them in the solution, Wait one minute, and most of the mice will already have released. Then a little bit of swirling agitation drops them down very, very quickly. You know what we do, so you don't have to go through the phone. <coughs> Boom! We put a 10x magnifying mirror underneath, and you can immediately count the mice. You can see their legs and everything, so they're magnified very easy. 
for a mind count. You don't ever want to see that many mites in one of your eyes. So, and but I use, I made a dedicated dildo, the Honda CRB. They opened the back door. I had a pull out table with a leg and a leveler, and we set it up and we just do, we do thousands of mic washes every year. We have down very, very rapid. And what I did is I realized there's no way in the world to be a commercial beekeeper or you're going to be doing hand agitations thousands of times. Your, your wrist will give out. So I, I built a series of, over the years, different kinds of mechanical agitators. This is my first generation uh, one right here. We can wash 12 cups at a time. It was, it's too bulky. This is my second generation right here. These are what we're using right now. These are, we have a bunch of these that are portable, battery powered. You push a button, it does 300 revolutions, and bingo, you're done. 60 seconds, you're done. We have these just running constantly. <clears throat> this is a fourth generation design, and now I'm on generation 4.3, and I hope to have um, all the set, uh, mostly assembled on my, on my workbench. I got the final things done, and I will soon be publishing, I hope within the next month, plans to be used worldwide. And the, way, the reason it's taken so long, I'm trying to come up with a device that Joe Beekeeper, with no special mechanical skills, can use off-the-shelf components and build their own mechanical agitators um, without having to go to a machine shop or something like that. So um, I, I, I finally got it dialed in on how to do that. I hope to be publishing the results soon. This changes everything. The, the commercial beekeepers have visited me and watch with our mechanical agitators. They go, oh my god, this is just amazing. It changes, changes everything for my management. So again, I don't make recommendations, but what I have observed in our operation, we don't allow the mite count in a half cup of bees to climb over one, maybe two mites maximum in springtime. We want to see zeros through the springtime. During the middle of summer, early July, if we start seeing the mice creeping up to five to six mice per half of the bees, we will treat them at that point. We never ever, that time, throughout the season, allow our mite count to get higher than that. Come November, when they shut down brood rearing and the mice come out of the brood, they may temporarily spike up to, you know, maybe nine mites or so, but then uh, we'll do the dribble in uh, December with oxalic acid to come down. The other thing to understand is mite drift. Especially if you have, are in an area such as you guys are. I'm, I'm looking at your, to the densities right here. Oh my God. <laughs> what are you guys thinking? You're exceeding the carrying capacity of land. Let me ask you, how many of you have seen your honey crops go down in the last 20 years? We are not talking about it. <laughs> oh, obviously not talking about it. Uh, my guess is your honey crops have probably gone down in the last 20 years. This is what happens when you put too many cattle on pasture. You exceed the carrying capacity of the land. You'd be better off running half as many colonies and making twice as much honey per colony. It's less work for more profit. I, and many beekeepers can't understand that concept of doing less work and making more money because they must just love to work hard for <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, the other thing is if you have beekeepers around you who are not controlling Varroa, Varroa hitchhikes ride, there's a tremendous amount of drift of bees between colonies. And I'm doing a lot of research on that right now. Um, we, I'm publishing where we actually uh, glued metal tags, color painted metal tags, 6,000 of them, on bees in nine colonies that are collapsing from Veromite. And then we put magnetic traps on the front of hives in our apiary and up to three miles away. And we have, I'll be publishing all the hard data of how much actual drift there is of mice out of. Uh, collapsing. How much B? How much B? We measured the B drift. We also then measured mite immigration into those hives. <clears throat> what we found is there's a lot of drift of bees around, <laughs> even at a half mile away. How many kilometers is that? Seven kilometers. Okay. Um, uh, consecutive kilometers. Yeah. Okay. Considerable mite drift there, at a mile away. What's that? One point six kilometers, I think. Uh, it's, it drops off. So we, and to do this, we eliminate all the mites in the hive using some synthetic miticides, because my, my, my mites have never seen synthetic miticides, so if we can eliminate all the mites. And then you do your sticky board counts. 
And, and what you do is you wait until there's no mice at all dropping in the hive. A, 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 a wash of the, of the mice, of the bees says zero mice. And then you check your, how many mice are coming in on the sticky boards. That means they came in from outside that hive. And what you, so this is your, your uh, every uh, three days, how many mice you found on the sticky boards. When it rains, it drops down to zero because there's no mice, no bee flight, so there's no mice coming in. When the rain clears, your mite immigration comes back up again. When it rains again, it drops back down to zero with the last mice that are coming in and, and dying. So this validates that we're actually seeing, measuring the mice that are coming in from outside rather than uh, generating from the colonies. And it's a real thing. Some of these colonies are immigrating 500 mice in the latter part of the season. And I, I, my guess, there is data showing you can actually get thousands of mice coming in, into a call. So my group is a real thing. We'll return to this when I talk about using extended reduced oxalic acid because my drift can overwhelm the treatment. So one thing that we do is we monitor our mite levels in every single colony in June. <laughs> and we identify these mite disseminators. And we started doing this the first time in 2015, the first time we ever did it. We had already treated the mice in, for mites in June and August, and we were curious in September what it looked like. What we found was, here's a histogram. This is, we had 203 highs. This tells you how many, this is your mite count in a mite wash. So this is zero to five mites in a mite wash, six to 10 mites, up to 100 mites in a mite wash. This is your number of colonies. So out of those 203 colonies, over 100 had mite counts of five or below. And then, <clears throat> then another 40 some had below 10. Now, when you break it down and you look at the total number of mites, 25% of the hives, these right here, contain 75% of the mites that are operation. And these high mite disseminators are constantly drifting via diffusion of mites from these few into all the rest of the hives. And this is consistent in every yard. I'll just show you data from four different yards here. What we find is you got maybe 10% of your hives in every single yard that are these very high mite disseminators. If you can identify them and control the mites in them, it makes your treatment for mites across your whole operation much, much easier. If you're doing a such a breeding program, that also then is negative selection. Any of these colonies that have zero resistance to Varroa, kill that queen right now. So they're not producing drones for the next season to mate with your resistant queens. You also then only breed from those colonies in this first column. Yeah. Have zero mite counts. Very, very easy. So that's what we do. We do positive <coughs> negative selection. We eliminate the queens that have high mite levels, and we only keep the queens that keep their mite counts to their colonies keep it to zero. <coughs> so the concept here, successful management is much easier if you can identify and pay special attention to those high mite outliers. Now if 10 years ago you would ask me, people did ask me, Randy, are you think, suggesting that we might wash every single hive in the operation? I would have said, I did say, oh no, that's unrealistic. Nobody's ever going to do that. Nowadays, we do. Every single year. Not only do we do it, but my sons say, Dad, how soon can we start? <laughs> they say, they're nervous in June if they haven't my wash every hive. And they say they, what they found is it's more cost effective. They actually save money by taking the time to do this because what they save on unneeded mite treatments more than pays all the labor for doing all the washes. It only works if you have these mechanical agitators because it cuts your labor costs down, which is why I feel so uh, compelled to get these dang agitators designed out for you guys so you can all use it. It'll change everything for you. It, it takes us four man minutes for mite wash. That includes <coughs> walking to a hive, opening it up, pulling the frame out, shaking the bees off, taking the sample, putting them in the cup, getting it back to the agitator, agitating it, recording that data, and putting a label on the hive, and then closing the hive back up. Four man minutes. Okay, so you forgot how much um, that costs you. So if we have a crew of, of three people go to a bee yard of 36 hives, that's a half an hour rather than we got mite wash on every single hive. It's just going bam. We'll go out 
said, well, we're going to go out, let's go out and might watch 500 hives a day. No big deal. Okay, by myself, in an afternoon, I'll, I'll do 50 hives very easily. So the, the reality is, is um, it makes a huge difference. The, the key thing is, <laughs> those beekeepers who are not doing mite washes, you're blind. You have no idea what's happening out there. You're trying to manage these colonies without just being totally blind. And the commercial beekeepers who, who visit me and do this, every morning goes, oh my god, Randy, I realize how blind I've been in my own operation. So now you go to plan your management strategy. Okay, first you can use my model um, uh, to figure it out, and you can look at different treatments and see what works in your operation, when your honey flow is, what you're interested in. So each mob, each beekeeper can come up with their own different strategy. I'm not going to tell you strategy. You plan your own strategy, but do it based upon biology. Now, you do have some treatment options. I'll tell you first. The most commonly used micro <coughs> strategy by hobby beekeepers is called wishful thinking. Okay? The mice aren't going to bother my, my bees. Um, that strategy has never ever worked. So, there's a big movement. I don't know if there's one here. In the United States, there's a big movement for treatment free beekeeping. People think that it's more important to be able to wear the t shirt that says, I'm a treatment free beekeeper, than it is to keep your livestock alive. And I showed them this photograph here. This is a puppy with a mice infestation. Okay, this puppy is suffering right now. If you put a leash on this puppy, and the, the, the owner of this puppy puts on her t-shirt and says, I'm a treatment-free puppy keeper, and you drag this poor infested puppy down the sidewalk, other dog owners are going to shun you, okay? They're going to call the, uh, uh, the government on you for approaching this puppy. It's no different when you have bees. You know, if you're keeping livestock, it's responsibility ethically to maintain your livestock and control their parasites. If you think that you're benefiting at all in genetically your uh, the bee population by allowing colonies to collapse and grow up, you're just fooling yourself. Slice of breeding is done at the queen level, controlling the queens and your your drones, and then you can make progress with like that. So don't use being uh, treatment free or organic, whatever it's like, excuse for poor husbandry. Okay, I'm going to skip my pesticides right now, just shoot up to synthetics. Um, so, the valnick, first time we had, that typically start failing after about six years of use. The mice could build up resistance very easily. Um, beekeepers then shifted mainly to uh, uh, amethyst. Well, well it's interesting. I didn't, I didn't even put in Kumofos in here. I didn't realize you guys even used Kumofos that I just saw on the presentation. What a disaster Kumofos that was. <laughs> oh my god, it works really good for a year or two, and then you get all that contaminated beeswax, and you can't raise queens in those, in those combs. You don't ever want to put Kumofos in the <laughs> um, So there are legal treatments with amateurs, around most of the world, beekeepers are using it illegally. They're, they're smuggling in, or using uh, a tactic, or uh, the In the US, uh, the EPA just started cracking down this year on the smuggling on it. And in much of the world, amateurs is now failing. Uh, it's taken a long time for mice to develop resistance to it, but it is happening. Um, I was approached years ago by the manufacturer of Amatraz and said, Randy, would it be worthwhile for us to um, register Amatraz uh, in a strip in the United States for sale to the beekeepers? I said, yeah, that would be really good. Um, he says, and then he said, he talked to me later and said, well, for us to do it, the EPA says, well, the risk cut for Amatraz because of people putting it on flea and tick collars for their pets increases the exposure, so we're not going to let you add an additional treatment for the bees unless you pull away one of your other treatments. So lower risk up. So he says, well, so we're going to give up selling tactic in the United States as a cattle treatment. And he says, but you can't tell anybody. <laughs> so for a year in advance, I knew that tactic was going to be removed from the U.S. market, but I couldn't tell anybody. So when I spoke at the national convention, I took a picture. I, we had never, I've never used tactic. But I took a post picture of my son 
Well, that's it. Said, so, Tatsun is the darling of our industry. Every, I know every commercial beekeeper is using it. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't tell you what's going to happen. So, but what if something happens and you don't have it? Are you prepared to use the uh, other treatments than the tactic? And uh, this is what's happening now. Now is the sensing for um, smuggling tactic. And we're starting to see resistance to amitraz. Um, it's taken a long time, but look at this. We have colonies now that are up to 22 times as resistant to amitraz as control colonies. And the researchers doing this have come to my operation to check my bees because I have non resistant um, mites, um, to check my mites, I should say, uh, to amitraz. And when I followed this out, to look at the difference in mite increase over the course of three years of uh, typically uh, amateur grass successful. Grass. Oh, yeah. So, can you hear me through this? Yes, no? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. This would be your mite buildup being 90% uh, and 80% treatments here over the course of three years. Then they come up, go down, come up, go down. Then I modeled, oh, I gotta change these lines. Um, these should go to some different ones. With a cost and fitness, which means how effective a female mite can reproduce, how many offspring she can have. So the valley had a pretty strong fitness cost, which means that the as soon as you stop using the valley, the non-resistant mites would start out competing the resistant mites, and you <coughs> should use the valley again. So I put in. Well, what would happen? Let's look at whether. Let's just say these, these mites are 50% resistant to the chemical, but now you have either a 50% cost in fitness, so that means you only make half as many offspring if you're a mite, or a 60% cost or a 70% cost. And I ran through a bunch of different um, figures, and it shows this. If, if you only had a 50% cost in fitness, we would have had the, the mites, the resistant mites, very quickly outcompete the non resistant ones. But we're not seeing that. We're still seeing the not the resistant ones, uh, non resistant ones uh, in there. Which means it looks like by my computer modeling, maybe there's a seventy percent cost of fitness. That's a very high fitness cost uh, for a mite to develop a mite population to develop um, resistance to amateurs, and that's why amateurs has lasted so long because of the they have to pay this fitness cost and it suppresses their ability to reproduce. But after 20 some years, they've gotten to that point. So this is what I'm now being pushed with for by beekeepers across the United States of Randy, Amadress is working operation. We know that you've been keeping, um, for example, I was at a USDA planning uh, meeting a few years ago, and they invited 11 of us commercial beekeepers, and they said, would you guys mind, they, they put 11 poster boards up on the wall, the was all up in, and they, labeled the dates from January to, to December. They said, could you please put down what your mite levels are throughout this season and what treatment you use to control them so we can get an idea. And in the discussion afterwards, one of us said, well, every one of us is 100% dependent upon amitraz. Amitraz, amitraz, amitraz. I didn't say anything. And later on the discussion, one of them <laughs> said, wait a minute, guys, actually only 10 out of the 11 are 100% dependent on the amitraz, because Randy doesn't use any amitraz whatsoever in his operation. And they go, oh yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> so anyway, now I'm being approached not so much by the older guys, but the next generation of beekeepers, the younger beekeepers who are taking over from dad, and they're going, well, obviously what dad's doing is not working. Randy, help us out here. What, what, how, how are you doing? So that's, that's what I'm doing right now. And um, <coughs> okay, so this is this is on my first year beekeeping, <coughs> but it shows the appropriate uh, uh, mite treatments. I did play amitraz right here for the timing when it's most appropriate to use. It's not 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 as appropriate for a fall treatment. It's much better as a springtime treatment. And then at different times of the year, which of the natural treatments or hand treatments? are most appropriate to use in beehives, and also suggested uh, periods of time when treatment uh, can be um, used to keep grow under control. Okay. 
Okay, just bought a bottle down. I, I had uh, a tumor in the back of my tongue, and I got radiation therapy two years ago, and it burned all my salivary glands out. So it's, they're slowly recovering, but um, I need to keep uh, pumping water in order to be able to talk. And I also, I've also been doing tongue exercises the last two days, stretching it out, because I find that I start to, my tongue is moving, I start to slur words, so I need to keep my tongue uh, limber. <laughs> Uh, anyway, but I don't want cancer anymore, so <laughs> that's, that's a good thing, okay, I'm, and I've got my energy back. Um, so well, how are we on time right now? They're okay. Okay, you know what, why don't I, why don't I take a few questions now, and then what I'll do is I was going to split onto the my treatments, but the thing is I could easily go a long time I got data, you guys will probably be interested. I'm, I didn't know what kind of audience I was speaking to. What I'm seeing is you guys seem to be a pretty astute audience here. So I do have data on oxalic acids. You will probably be unpublished yet. It's to be published. It's going to rock the boat on oxalic acid. Ruth <laughs> smiling here because she's very, been very much involved in getting this data. So what I'll do is let me take a couple questions. Um, if you have to, do a bathroom break. Why don't you do it right now while we're doing the questions, and then we can um, uh, hop on to uh, how to use the uh, the natural mycocytes, and then I can go right into this uh, this afternoon. I'll go into the oxalic acid uh, data and go much deeper into the oxalic acid. That sound good? Okay. Any questions right now? I have a question. Uh, how popular is uh, how popular is uh, formic acid in the United States? For, formic acid. Formic acid. Yes. Um, it is, it is popular, um, mostly in the form of the quick strips uh, from Nadia Hairy products out of Canada, Mitoway Quick Strip, <coughs> the Formic Pro. You have a much greater diversity of application methods in Europe uh, of different app, uh, applicators. Um, we buy formic acid by the 55 gallon drum. Okay, so <laughs> we use a lot of formic acid, um, not necessarily by Approved methods, okay, um, <laughs> in our operation. Um, yeah. Uh, what is the average? Uh, uh, what is the average uh, um, concentration of the, your um, formic acid? Depends on how you want to use it. Typically, it's sixty-five percent. But if you're doing a flash treatment overnight, you can drop it usually to fifty percent. Uh, it, it all depends on the application method. I'll be showing some tips on formic acid in a few minutes. Okay. Well, same thing with me, they're all afraid to ask questions. <laughs> yeah. Some, sometimes the audience is just looking at me and going, oh, information overload, oh, <laughs> too much information. Okay, you guys ready to move on then? Okay. Let's see. Somebody come here and help me at the computer. Somebody can read Slovenia. I need somebody who can go to the next slideshow here. Yes. I'm waiting for a translation. Okay, go ahead. Uh -huh. Sir? Yeah, some, sometimes we do that, and sometimes we extend it out uh, later. I'll, I'll show you the, the, the overnight shot at 50% can work very, very well. I'm going to get mites eliminated from a hive overnight, and, I'm, and I can either pull the queen out or, or typically if a hive has that high a mite level, I have no interest in saving the queen. Okay? So I'm happy just to kill that queen with formic acid also and eliminate all the mites from that hive. So yeah, we'll do an overnight uh, heavy, about 90 milligrams, no, 90 milliliters of 50% formic acid in hot weather. It could be you know, 35, 40 degree uh, centigrade outside. And we'll blast them, put them on at, at, at sundown, we know direct sun on there. And you're going to see a, a handful of dead bees the next morning, but you're going to see very few mites left in that hive. So uh, that does work very well. Okay. Hey, I need somebody up here to help me. I need another slide. I need. <laughs> 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 
New presentation. So it should, it should be uh, Oh, uh, that one right there. We're getting my side. Yes. And then you want to do, um, do right click. All right. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. So this is where we left it off. So. Like I said, we've been using only the quote organic miticides and natural treatments for 21 years here. Uh, mainly formic acid, thymol, or oxalic acid. I just showed you that one there. So let's start with the essential oils first. Um, and here's the thing humans love the smell of essential oils. We put them on our bodies, put them on the bath, in the bathtub. And humans then think, well, maybe the bees will like those essential oils also. Bees hate the essential oils. They're very disruptive to the colony. Those beekeepers who are dumping essential oils in their hive are torturing their bees. Now, there are some, a number of essential oils that show promise, especially in the lab. But if you take them out to the field, then we don't have this good result. But there are still other essential oils that are promising to use. I have a few at, at home. I get, uh, suggestions from beekeepers all over the world, different things to try. So I'm, I'm continually trying uh, treatments. Um, of the essential oils, the best proven is thymol by far. Or you say thymol or thymol here? Thymol. Thymol, okay. So there's various forms of thymol uh, in different uh, countries. Um, well, we, uh, in the United States, we have this one. Uh, it's in a uh, gel, a water-based gel of so like the um, sodium polyacrylate that's used in diapers. So Tmol does not dissolve in water to any extent at all. So it, this is a suspension. So it's not dissolved, but it's little particles of, of Tmol in an aqueous suspension. <clears throat> and this works um, uh, quite well. But for it to work, the bees need to physically remove it. It does not work very well by vapor action when it's put into the hive. They actually have to pick up every piece and move them. I'll show you why in a second. <coughs> Another one is apolite bar. That is an additional essential oils, and this is applied in a cellulose uh, matrix right here. So, so the T-Maw will dissolve into the oils uh, right here. I find that this is really irritating to the uh, bees in the hive, so um, we, we don't use this. Um, and then a number of beekeepers make their own pads with T-Maw, typically di um, dissolving it into this or that vegetable oil, maybe adding other essential oils. So they all come up with their own special magical recipe of, of T-Maw and something with, you know, my wife likes this smell, you know, my daughter <laughs> likes this smell, and they, they put them all in. So I, I've experimented with many of, of these. And there's a couple of problems. The bees don't like the smell of Timon at all. And if, um, they often will just put propolis all over it and cover it up, at which point it's ineffective. So they're blocking off the vaporization of it. Or they will build a wall around it. They look, they look like flowers like this. They just keep building it up to try to keep those you know, it from um, uh, the vapors from getting into the hive. So I was curious whether we could come up with an improved delivery method. Now we know that um, with Apigard, there's 12 and a half grams per dose, but you have to do two doses in a hive. Typically, I do it at 10 days. Um, so when they remove the first dose, you have to put a second dose. So that requires two trips to the hive to do that. In our operation, everything we do is about efficiency. The least amount of work possible to get the most results. That's different than most beekeepers. Most beekeepers make everything as difficult as possible that they can ever do, okay? Um, but our operation is all about efficiency, the minimum amount of work to get the maximum benefit. So I looked at the amount of active ingredient, the, the dose for treatment, for Apigar, Apolite bar, and Fema bar. This is a Canadian treatment. And it varies from 12 grams 8 grams here, 15 grams, but this one requires three treatments. This requires 
one uh, uh, weekly intervals for several weeks, and this requires again uh, 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 reapplication. So it takes multiple applications for all of these. We're trying to eliminate. I'm trying to eliminate multiple applications. Every time you open a hive, that costs me money. So I wondered, what if I just took Tmall and dissolved it in straight alcohol? It dissolved very readily in straight, straight alcohol. I one to one ratio. A brand new Tmall will dissolve completely in one milliliter of straight alcohol. And then you can dish a cellulose matrix into that, take it out, and in an hour, the alcohol is evaporated away. Tmall evaporates very, very slowly. People think that Tmall evaporates rapidly. That's completely untrue. It's very low, what's called a vapor pressure. It takes a long time for Tmall to evaporate. So the alcohol evaporates away, leaving just pure Tmall crystals in that cellulose matrix. And I experimented putting just a, a, a paper towel uh, into it, uh, eyes. And I found that you put 12 milliliters, 12, 12 grams of Tmall on the paper towel on a hot day into a hive and it drives all the bees out of the hive. Way, way, way too strong. You can put in six grams of Tmall, about half a dose, and the bees will tolerate that. And unlike the gel, they will, whether, if, if you go to a beehive and you put Tmall crystals into a, uh, like a jar lid on top of the top bars and then leave it there, even in very hot weather, those crystals will still be there when you come back two weeks later. There's very slow evaporation. <laughs> Of the chemo. If instead you put it on a paper towel and put it between the brood chambers, the bees now fan very rapidly over it and they evaporate that chemo off. So in a few days, the chemo is all evaporated. So the evaporation happens very slowly, it's still there, but rapidly the bees are creating a current of air. Then once they, the concentration of the fumes drops down, they will immediately start chewing on that paper towel and then remove it from the hive. So within a few days, they've removed the paper towel. So it was not an, uh, enough to dose. So what I was curious about, when they remove that, where, how does the T-mall actually get to the mites? I found out with the Apigar gel, if the bees don't physically remove it, it is inefficient in killing the mites. So I used a fluorescent tracer that glows under black light, and I mixed it with the Apigard gel. I put that on the top bars, and I put a sticky gel underneath. I also took a paper towel, a blue paper towel, and put that side by side on there uh, with Timo with no, no tracer to see, because I could see the blue towel, and to see what would happen. And after uh, four days after the application, <coughs> The bees didn't carry it out of the hive so much, they just chewed it up and dropped it down. So that means those particles of that gel or the particles of the paper towel have to filter down through all the bees between the brood frames. And that's apparently where that exposure to the mites on the brood comes from that T-mall, from the particles filtering down through all the bees. That make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. So these are important things to understand when you're trying to develop the T-mall. The other thing I noticed, the bees tended on when you mix up a uh, vegetable oil with the <coughs> oil, vegetable oil, the bees seemed to propolize that. So I did an experiment where we did 16 different combinations, portions of tea mall to vegetable oil at different doses and put all 16 into each hive, a number of hives, and went back every couple of days and observed how the bees reacted to it. And we used a, um, a fiber board made from a recycled newspaper called Homosy. It's a, a, a standard insulation uh, board. And what we found was, if you put in vegetable oil, it tends to propolize over it and block the release of chemo. If instead you put in no vegetable oil, they chew it away and eventually will remove it entirely from the column. So I said, well, that's the end of vegetable oil for me. Let's just stick with just straight T-mol and alcohol. And here's Rose, right? Rose, here, come on, stand up, everybody can see where you are. <laughs> There's Rose's. So you'll be seeing pictures of, of Rose. Rose had never been in the beehive last July. She made a mistake of showing up at a local beekeepers meeting, and I was looking for helpers. And she gave her raise your hand. She's been immersed into hardcore field research ever since then. Okay, so we'll be seeing results from the last session. She's done with me.
So I was curious, what if we put that 12 gram dose in a homosote block? Now instead of it being in a thin layer of paper towel, it's in a half inch, about one centimeter thick cellulose uh, block. <clears throat> and I thought maybe that will slow the release of the evaporation of the chemo uh, uh, from the paper towel. What we found is with 12 grams in a hive, the bees hardly even notice it. The, um, the brood look good normally with chemo treatment. They're going to move the brood nest away from it. The, it it's very disruptive to the colony. That didn't happen. It really surprised me. So emboldened by that observation, we tried 24 grams in a hive at a time. And the same thing, we either put it above the hive in a rim below the cover or in between the brood chambers. And they took tolerate 24 grams pretty well. And what we found is they'll start chewing away after uh, a week or two, and uh, eventually they will just chew these blocks out in, entirely. And you see them chewing it away right here. So we tried 36 grams and then 48 grams uh, in the hive at one time. Now 48 grams, you put in 48 grams on any of the commercial products, you're going to blow the bees right out of the hive. You're going to kill massive brood kill pupae all over the bottom board. Doesn't it happen? People with 48 grams apply in this manner. Uh, yeah, we talk about 48 grams of pure chemo, uh, not pure pure chemo. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, what we found, and this was in hot weather. This was 35 to 40 degrees centigrade hot weather. Okay. Yeah, that's what we said. Surprising, huh? Okay, again, here's a picture. Um, after, this is after 21 days of this being in the hive. Now, if it had killed the young brood, seriously, you would notice it in the brood pattern after 21 days because they would all have been missing. That's what the brood pattern looked like after 21 days in hot weather with, with 48 grams of pure Timo put into that hive on four blocks. After 74 days, this is with the, the blocks at the top, this car was busting for the honey, looking beautiful, and the mite count was, oh, mite count went to zero at 21, and it was still at zero at this point. We, we like, our target is always the mite count of zero, okay? In case you weren't good on that. Um, uh, so it's pretty exciting. What I found with the 48 gram between the brood chambers is a little bit intense for a colony. But uh, they tolerate as well. So now, because I tested it with zero, with 12 grams, 24, 36, and 48, on very small numbers of colonies, okay? But this is preliminary research, okay? Enough to get me excited about where we're going to be going this season. So I could make a dose response curve here. So at, and this would be your percent mite reduction right here. So with the 12 grams, kind of one hive, 100% reduction. But another hive, only 30% reduction. So not, not quite enough. 24 grams, now we're talking 70 to 100% reduction. 36 grams, now we're talking 90 to 100% reduction. And 48 grams, 100% reduction. So it looks like the sweet spot may be around that 36 grams applied in this manner. Um, anyway, so this is preliminary research, but this this year we're going to collect more data on this. But to me, this is very, very exciting. Um, now, I don't know what your regulatory agencies are here. So for all this experimental research, I have to get a permit from our from our state of California. So I have a pesticide research authorization to use this. So I, I, I got to stay legal on this. Um, and unfortunately, our regulatory agencies move about as fast as plate tectonics. Um, <laughs> so very, very frustrating. I'll be talking about this uh, later on, um, what we beekeepers could be asking for, because there's a way around this. But I'm in constant. I had a, the day before I left, I was in a, uh, a call with the uh, uh, department, USDA. I'm in calls with the, with the um, EPA trying to get them to see that we're a, a, a very small industry and we need, and the big chemical companies, it's not worth their time 
to follow up all these, these better improved methods of the natural treatments because we're not getting money in it for them. So this is tough. Okay, now we move into the organic acids, one of which is a vegetable extract from the hops plant, one of which is a vaporizing product, vaporizing at room temperature or high temperature, and one which is normally non-vaporizing. So I don't know if you use any hospital acids here. Is it this registered in Slovenia at all? Of course. It is registered? It I think it was. It was, okay. So uh, the current formulation is hop guard three. They've changed the extraction method a little bit. So this one's a little bit easier on the bees than hop guard one or hop guard two. <coughs> and it, it does work. The bees will tend to move away from it at first, and then they'll come back, they'll put brood right underneath the strip when, the, uh, when they've removed it, uh, this. Um, this will work uh, if the colony is broodless, even a single treatment will work and get very good life reduction. If there is brood, it's gonna take a minimum of two, maybe three repeated treatments. Uh, on my website, I have articles written on data about this and trying it at different intervals. I've cut it short here because I have so much information. Um, if you want more information on this, go to my website and read the actual data from our, our field experiments. The next one is formic acid. We have an ant in our area, a um, <coughs> ant that live in uh, dead trees. <coughs> if you scoop up a handful of these and take a sniff, <coughs> you will choke from the formic acid and your eyes will water. Very strong. <laughs> Formic acid application or release from these ants. This is something that the bees have dealt with ants before they were human beings. So um, they're used to formic acid. And the beauty of formic acid is the only one of these mitocides that actually penetrates the cappings. And what we do is after treatment, we'll do a capping scratcher, take the cappings off of the combs, the brood, bang it on the top of the hive, knock the pupae out and then see what percentage of the mites are alive and what percentage are dead. So with a high enough dose, yes, you can penetrate the cappings overnight and kill the mites in the sealed group. But the problem that we'll get to clean today. So the, the other thing with formic acid is after treatment, the root, first root pattern after application always looks beautiful. And I'm not sure what happened whether it's a sterilizing effect on the combs or what it is, but you can take a colony with a lousy looking root pattern, you do a formic acid treatment, and it comes back almost always with a really pretty looking uh, root pattern. The problem is, is that it may induce the bees to supersede or kill their, their queens. <clears throat> so one option is, if you're a hobby beekeeper, you can put the queen in the cage with some attendance and some candy, put her in the house for the first couple of days while that initial flash of formic acid is there, and then reintroduce her back into the uh, colony. The other thing to do is to use a, a, a slow release of um, formic acid. So these, do you have these strips registered in Slovenia? Yeah, okay. So this is uh, the formic pro, the new one, uh, which has the advantage that the bees will actually chew this all out of the hive <coughs> afterwards and you don't have to go back and scrape out the uh, uh, remainder that uh, they do with the uh, uh, mitre with quick strips. Um, and these were made because the beekeepers complained with their original product, which was called the mitre weight 2 pad, which was a plastic bag with a bone soap fiber board in there. And the beekeepers complained about, oh, we don't want to put a rim on top of our hives to use this, but um, that actually was a very good product. Um, we bought a pallet of them, and um, we keep recycling them. We reuse them, then we collect them, they're still doing the plastic bag, and then we just put the formic acid back into them and use them over and over again. We've done that for years, so they're not for sale anymore. But, but <coughs> they're similar to some of your uh, uh, evaporators you have in Europe, where you can adjust the, uh, the holes in the top and adjust your release rate. Um, we're, we don't have those available to us in the United States. So with one strip, you have, uh, it's easier on the queens, uh, but you have to repeat it after 10 days. In the hot weather of brood, you get maybe a 50% mite reduction. That's not that good. If you want to do it a little more intense, you do two at one time, you'll have more queen losses, but um, get a quicker uh, mite knockdown. 
And then there's all the other ways. This, so this is a flash forming flash board. If you have an absorbent pad, you pour a measured amount of 50% formic acid on there, put it on at the end of the day, put it on top of the hive, and overnight it's all gone by more. And so you can uh, get good mite reduction, depending upon how much you, you put on. 90 milliliters of 50% will, will knock out a large proportion of the queens, but uh, you do a good overnight mite kill. Lower amounts, you'll, you'll save more queens, but you'll get less efficacy. So it is a natural treatment. And the beauty of formic acid, there are no residues left. A little tiny bit of honey, but that evaporates soon, but you don't have any comb contamination. We like it, especially for cleansing out the really high mite hives that we want to just eliminate the mites from. It does penetrate. Um, it's a good knockback treatment. So if you have honey in the hive, you don't want to kill the queen, you just shove one strip in, in the middle of the honey flow, and, you, and it's proof of that use, and we'll knock back the mice to buy you time to get the honey off. Um, we'll talk about nukes, and you do have a short set, but usually it'll knock out the eggs and the other larvae, so you lose about five days of, of room break. <clears throat> so one of the things we did this last summer is experiment with reducing the queen kill. And what I noticed is, one of the things you can do is, hang on, over here. Let me go through the let's go back. When I, one of the things I, I looked at is covering the top of the strip to slow down the evaporation rate. Where I took a, um, um, the actual wrapper, uh, the Mylar wrapper, and and keep the strip out carefully, and then put the wrapper over the top of the strip. So now you have very little exposure on the bottom because you have the top bars that's resting on. No, no evaporation for the top. So you only have the evaporation for the interspaces between the top bars and the ends of the strip. And so the uncovered strip, this is your gram weight loss per day. So the uncovered strip that you have here. The cover strip is right here, and your optimal range for grams per day would be in this area right here. And you can see you get the spike with the either the Formic Pro or the Mighty Quick Strips. On the high side right here, this is what knocks out your queens right, right here, that first day spike. By covering the top, you can avoid that first day spike, and you actually are have an increased release for the next several days by covering that top. So you extend the release out a little bit. So one of the things that we have to treat is we may treat our nukes with formic acid in hot weather. So again, we're up in those, in those high 30s. And what we found is if you just put a half a strip in like this and then cover the top of the strip with the lid, and here's Rose demonstrating her balancing act, how to press that lid down. It has to touch the top of the strip and squeeze it down. That strip then... Instead of being dry after a week, 10 days, maybe two weeks later, it's still moist and has formic acid. So it does an extended release treatment. <coughs> I took this picture. This is one of Rosa's first days out here. She never smelled formic acid. <laughs> so I had <laughs> her, but I didn't have Tammy here. said, here, uh, see if this still has formic residues in it. And Rosa is saying, yes, it still has formic residues in that strip, even after uh, 10 days in, in, a, in a high. So we did the experiments of taking that mylar and covering the top of the strip right here. <coughs> so this is, we did this in, in one yard uh, with a bunch of colonies. And we looked at this, we, here's our starting mite count, this is the blue column, the mites per half cup of bees, and the ending mite count is in the red column. So what you want to do is see a lot of blue showing and not much um, uh, uh, red. Um, so we don't see that much blue. So not a really good reduction, about a 50% overall reduction in my levels after 21 days. But that was only a half treatment, one, one strip, only one, one application. So that's not uh, too surprising. The main thing is, we got roughly the same percentage of micro that we did in the same yard with the same experiment exactly but without <coughs> covering the strip, we got substantial mite kill the year before. This year, we got zero queen loss. So covering the strip eliminated queen loss, 
Well, we got roughly the same amount of micro reduction, so this is uh, promising. In the second yard, we did, um, um, uh, let's see, oh god, down here. I, I think we did two, two out, oh god, I didn't put down the one or two applications. So that was one application. Oh, Rose, I didn't put that down in here. I can't remember. Anyway, so this is after, um, Okay, so half half the highs we did we did not cover, and half the highs we did cover, and it looks like we got roughly the same um, uh, mic kill on them, but again not super good. It's like here where we see a lot of blue, we got very good mic kill, but we saw a lot with um, <coughs> moderate. Mic. But the point was we weren't looking for mic kill. We already know in hot weather with blue, you don't get that good a kill with formic acid. But mainly you are really able to eliminate corn loss. So if you do have to use something in hot weather that's approved for use when honey is on the hive, and you don't want to kill your queens, simply when you take the wrapper off, put it over the top of the strips, that will pretty much eliminate your queen kill. Then we said, well, why if you even slowed it down even more? What if you just took that strip, the uh, wraps here, and cut off the ends with scissors, and then Cut it in half. Now the only release would be from the ends right here. I'm going to spread those ends across the top bars here, put it between the brood chambers, <clears throat> and then we put a reducer in the hive to only leave a small entrance. This again was in very hot weather, and this way we try to trap the fumes in the hive to see what would happen. Then I took some high-tech equipment, uh, our high-tech method of determining the performing <laughs> fumes, Oh, uh, <laughs> sniffing at the entrance. Uh, uh, and I'll tell you, the, the human nose is very good for detecting formic vapors. And there were, the first hour or so, a little bit, but then no formic fumes at all. Um, and we left those in there to see what would happen. And the results were, it's really easy on the bees. No root kill, no queen loss. No. But it's also really easy on the mice. <laughs> it didn't bother the mice back at all. So, so that low dose extended did not work. So now let's move on to <laughs> oxalic acid. Now, in California, <coughs> growing up in California, this is my grandson here. Mm -hmm. Every California grows up uh, going out in the springtime, and we call it sour grass. It's buttercup oxalis. You pick it, you suck, you suck on the stem, chew it up. And that's a mixture of oxalic acid and a sugar solution. That's what the sap of that buttercup oxalic acid uh, oxalis is. This is the namesake of oxalic acid, just the genus of the plant is oxalis. <coughs> so the common method of putting it on is a liberal method, applying five milliliters per bee space. Although Holly Tamema from Estonia has done some research suggesting putting on a, uh, a larger, a lower dose at a higher volume. We did one experiment with that, um, which I'll show you. Um, uh, we didn't see an advantage to that. But we're going to return, I'm going to show you a lot of data <laughs> this afternoon. And I, if you go to my website, uh, just go to Google, Google oxalic acid treatment table. I have mixing instructions for this. Um, we typically use the, um, the, uh, the medium dose right here in our operation. We apply it with a garden sprayer set at a um, very uh, uh, low pressure. So it puts out not a spray, but a stream. And the trick here is leave a huge air space, put only a small amount of the liquid, the oxalic acid solution at the bottom, and a big air space. And that way, when you pump the pressure, when you apply it to a hive, the air pressure doesn't change and it's consistent. If there's a small air space, you're always having to pump it up. So we have a big air space on there. And then we calibrate, you take a graduated cylinder and you you want to put five milliliters in per seam. So time yourself with a, a stopwatch or a counting and put the trigger on into a cylinder and <coughs> count to 10 seconds. Chimpanzee one, chimpanzee two, chimpanzee three, get to 10. And then look at the cylinder. If you have 50 milliliters, now you've calibrated yourself for the right dose. And you can, after you do it a few times, you can look at that stream and you, you can very accurately then 
apply the dose. Then you just walk up to the high, you just go, put the trigger on, go, your hands in one, your hands in two, you don't have to say <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. It takes you 10 seconds to do 10, 10 frames of beats. It can't hit the wood, it has to go on the bees themselves. So very, very fast. You can do hundreds of highs per day. It, this is our highs. Your highs are going to be a little bit. <laughs> and this is, um, here's my son's putting on for winter treatment. You can do it down almost, almost to freezing. And um, we hit uh, both boxes. Uh, we, we go beyond the recommended dose in Europe. We do it per, we don't have a maximum. So a really strong colony, we'll give it until we hit every every seam of these. And this this is a huge thing for us. So the two big things in our operation that really improve grow management, number one, the springtime treating with the induced brew break with an uh, oxide dribble, costs us pennies. And then the fall, or um, early winter, usually before Christmas, dribble with oxide acid, costs us pennies. So we've done most of our mic control for the entire year, costing us just pennies and very, very little time. Now, what you can do during the summer, you can, uh, because there's very low efficacy if there's brood, you can create an induced brood break by caging the queen. They do this a lot in Italy, uh, Spain. The problem is the bees don't like having the queen caged very much. And they may wind up rejecting the queen when you release her, um, or even while she's in there. Another way to do it, uh, is with um, uh, division work. So you guys with your AZ hives, this is something you might think about. We use these for queen work in order to isolate the queen so we can get all larvae at the same age on a cell for drafting our queens. <coughs> all we do, we take a queen, metal queen center, cut it in half, lay it over this piece of plywood, and then cut out the right size space and staple it in. And this goes all the way to the uh, top of the um, of the box all the way down to the bottom board. So when you put the lid on, you can find the queen uh, in here. So we put two of those queen slitters here with a comb in between them. And now the queen is confined to a single comb right here between the two queen slitters. And we, you only have to uh, confine it for two weeks. I don't know why people wait longer, because it's a long root break where you can find the queen. <coughs> and then, uh, on, on day 21, on day uh, 14, I'm going to show you in a second, you release the queen, let her start laying again. On day 21, you remove that frame, uh, freeze it, or what are you going to do with it, and dribble the hive. So here's, and this again is on my first year of beekeeping, get this timeline. So go out on a Saturday, confine your queens. Two Saturdays later, release all those queens, but leave the frame in there. And then on the third Saturday, now what you're going to do is pull that frame out and uh, um, give it to the chickens or freeze it to kill the mites and then drill with the colony right then. So very, very easy way to create that induced food break during the summer. This is one for smaller scale people because we don't have hundreds of hives. <coughs> How much oxalic acid vaporization is being done in this country? Are you guys vaporizing at all? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. <coughs> so the big question is, it's really quick, um, um, and, it, and the main thing I see the reason beekeepers like this, no. they don't want to open the hive. Oh my God, why beekeepers really want to actually open the hive, okay? So they, I don't know why beekeepers are afraid of opening the hive, but they want this vaporization. I'll tell you right now, my crew uses large amounts of, of formic acid, and oxalic acid. Q, I mean, we buy oxalic acid in, in the 25 kilo bags, multiples of them. We have lots of experience with all these acids. And when I bought a vaporizer to do some experimentation, to a man on my crew, they all said, why in the world would anybody vaporize a hive? It's more expensive, it's more time confusing, it's less efficacious, why would they do that? Now that's just the opinion of my crew. <coughs> okay, so the question is, it's quick, but during the summer, it is Efficacious if they're calling these But how about during the summer? <clears throat> so, okay, let me compare it here. 
Okay, so here's where we did um, uh, 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 dribble test this uh, summer. We did four dribbles, so that'd be like four stations at four day intervals um, to test. And we used different, we, that was oxalic acid, five milliliters of oxalic acid, and 20 milliliters with a little bit of time all added. Oxalic acid and just 20 milliliters of water, but Jermaine was talking about, and then a control group. And we see is too much red. Very poor efficacy, even with four treatments um, in, the, in the colony. But we also took colony strength measurements. And notice that, so here, the blue is the starting strength, how many frames of these, the red is the ending strength. And notice these colonies that were dribbled did not grow, but the control group, which we did not dribble, all grew in strength. So that repeated treatment with the dribbles um, had an adverse effect during the summer. We don't see that uh, so much with the vaporization. So the question is, how well does the vaporization work with repeated treatments? So I have now got data sets from about a dozen beekeepers from all over the United States and yeah. other countries in the world, where they have gone out and done repeated vaporizations and counted how many mice fall on the sticky board after the vaporizations over time, and sent me all their raw data, I'll be publishing an analysis of all that. But I use this as an example. This beekeeper in uh, Seattle, Washington, uh, east or the west so coast so nice on army. Of, of the United States, uh, he repeated at four day intervals. Every four days, he did a vaporization with one gram per blue chamber. So each one of these red triangles <coughs> indicates a vaporization. Now, if it were efficacious, after a few vaporizations, your mice drop and drop to zero. Notice how long it took, how many vaporizations it took. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten vaporizations. And they finally got the mic count down. We waited a couple of weeks and checked again, and the mic drop was up. And we vaporized them again and again and again until they finally went into the winter with a low mic count. Now, this, what I found is across the board with all these data sets, it takes most beekeepers seven to ten vaporizations to take the mic count down while colonies are actually growing green. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking that one vaporization in the summer is going to do much, you're, you're, you're dreaming. It's just it's not going to happen. Now, one of the reasons for that is what's your allowable dose here? For how many grams per brew chamber? Single gram. One. Single gram. <laughs> yeah. So single gram, recent research is showing uh, from Cameron and Jack, single gram is inadequate. You really have to get up to that two to four grams per box. And I was just showing you data this afternoon of comparing one gram per brew chamber to three grams per brew chamber of, of what happens. So, then, so we need to talk to our regulatory agencies and increase the amount of grams. And that's happening right, AP Doxol is looking at this right now, of increasing that. Okay. <laughs> So then in 2015 came a great idea out of Argentina. Um, I was actually notified by Argentina years before this that this was coming, so I hopped on it and tested it. And that's take, doing an extended release similar to with the, the plastic strips with the uh, synthetic biocides, where you, you extend the release rate out. You can do the same with oxalic acid by dissolving it in glycerin and putting it into a matrix in the hive. And this is what we've really been focusing on in the last several years, again, with a research authorization. So whenever I speak in the United States, I have to say, Randy Oliver is not advocating or encouraging the use of this uh, unapproved method uh, in your colonies. This is solely experimental results for uh, our information. Okay, so now I've covered my mouth. Yes. <laughs> what we found is, with a, you guys are familiar with Swedish sponges? The cellulose sponges for the, for the kitchen? Mm -hmm. They're about this size. That's our, so far, our favorite uh, matrix. And we cut them in half, so two pads. Mm -hmm. Here's the results of putting, and <clears throat> those pads, if you dissolve uh, one gram of oxalic acid and one gram of, of, one gram of glycerin in one to one formulation, uh, you get 25 grams that uh, uh, each half sponge will absorb. So if you put two of those in a hive, notice the amount of blue here, okay? 
this was a 90% reduction <coughs> across the board of mice. Very efficacious on this uh, treatment at 42 days. What we found out later, if we ran this to 60 days, it would be even better. 60 to 70 days is where you get your maximum re reduction. So very long-term treatment. <coughs> and I'll let you decide. This looks like there's adverse effects upon the balloon. This is at the end of treatment with the two paths that you see right here. All we see is the colonies thrive. So I get texts all the time from beekeepers sending me photographs of their hives. Here's a typical one from this beekeeper on the east coast of the United States, who I have to assume has an extended, has an experimental use permit, because it's not legal to do yet. But he goes, Randy, this is what my colonies look like right now. This is what the brood looks like. These are the best honey crops I have made since Varroa uh, arrived. And this is the best survival of my colonies I've, I've ever had. They just wax poetic about this. <clears throat> so this is very promising. We, we need to get this approved by our regulators. Now here's the interesting thing. We had a, a grad student working with native bees up in the high Sierra, uh, uphill from where I live, up at uh, 6,500 uh, feet. Um, so what's that, 200 meters? 2,000 meters, yeah, 2,000 meters. High elevation, where there were no honeybees whatsoever. Okay, no, no feral bees, no managed honeybees. And they needed us to bring in some colonies of bees to introduce honeybees to compare the pollination of a native plant uh, and what the effect on the native pollinators. Unfortunately, I just got the result. They said there was an adverse effect on that plant and an adverse effect on the native pollinators by bringing honeybees in. Uh, I didn't want to hear that, but um, their paper looks good, and I commended them, but I also just downloaded their raw data. <laughs> yes. As they say, you can torture data with statistics until it says yes, okay? <laughs> so I'm going to torture their data and see if I come up with the same conclusion. Now look at the results here. Do you notice the distinct lack of red? If you don't see a red column, that means the ending mite count was zero. Look at the starting mite counts. 50, 50 mites and a half of bees. Okay, 40 mites. These, normally your colonies would die. There'd be no recovery. Um, um, this was uh, late in the summer, putting these on, and it took them down to zero. This was at 77 days. This was incredible. This was a consistent in every one of these. We had, um, Four different isolated yards, three of them behind the mountains, one out in the desert in Nevada, where there's no other bees. In every one of those yards where there's no mite migration from the outside, it just zeroed out the mites. This is just like oh, goosebumps just even thinking about this. It is so incredible. So, again, <coughs> this mite immigration is an issue with these dead bodies on the outcasting. Now, the Argentinians, they use these uh, chipboard or cardboard strips, um, and they use a higher ratio of glycerin to oxalic acid than we like. We find their ratio of high glycerin is really sloppy to use, and it gets all over your gloves and your, your high tools and your smoker and your car handle and your clothing and everything else. We like the lower ratio so it makes a strip that is less glycerin. -y. Um, anyway. So the first year I tried this, um, I found out, wow, this works. And my son comes over and I said, Eric, man, look at this with these strips. You know, this is working really well. And he goes, he looks at it and he goes, uh, how many strips per hive? I said, well, four strips per hive didn't do it. It took eight strips per hive to do it. He goes, let's see, 1,500 hives times eight strips. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, not going to work, Dad. Too much labor. Come up with something else. So that initiated me then on to trying commercial beekeepers in the United States. This is called the blue shop towel. This is how all the off label treatments are applied. Uh, amateur is called the blue shop towel. So since the beekeepers were already familiar with it, I said, well, let me try it on blue shop towels. So very easy to lay across. Uh, got decent mic control, but inconsistent. Some colonies will chew them out too fast, some will propolize them over. 
So I tried different things, and that's where I came up with these Swedish sponges, which do work very well. You put two in a hive, you leave a space between for the pollen and sub patty uh, right here. And then I was curious in subsequent years, this is years of research now, exactly how much dose do you need for a double deep hive? So we treated hives with either, we cut the, the sponges in quarters and put in either one, one strip, two strips, three or four strips, and then compared the mite level on it. And we wondered whether we could, on a colony with a low mite infestation rate, we could get by with only one strip and use the four strips for the higher two mite ones. Um, and what we found out is, um, no, for low mite level, you can't use one strip. You have to use the full amount, and it does take four strips. So uh, the full equivalent of one Swedish sponge, um, which is 55 square inches on my I'm going to give you a link and make you look at it and tell you how many square centimeters. But that's, it's, it's the surface area that's important, not the dose of oxalic acid. That surface area that these are supposed to. And I have tested all kinds of matrices. I'm looking for biodegradable ones, no plastic, so that if you, you can chill them in a compost pile or if they, they on the ground or your bee yard, you don't have decomposing plastic in there. And some seem to work. The next best one we found is these uh, Spiltech Maximizer uh, industrial absorbent pads. They do have a little plastic in them, um, and they do have a fire retardant, which um, I cannot disclose what it is, but it does not seem to be a, a, a problem because it's not a chemical that I would be concerned about. Um, so, but these are only one tenth the cost of the Swedish sponges. And we use these a lot, and they, they also work well. And uh, the Swedish sponges, when I put them, test them up, put them in a the compost pile, go back out later and dig them out, and yes, they just get completely degraded, so that I like that. I've also tested, that all of this research is on my website, I'm going to skim you the quick version, okay, of testing out different kinds of cotton battings, which look really promising, but um, they did not from as well as the uh, sponges right here. So we do like a one-to-one -one formulation, um, not the sloppy Argentine one. <laughs> and we, we like how easy uh, quick it is just to, instead of putting six to eight strips in, just open the hive and stop, stop, two strips in, close the hive, walk away. Leave them in there for two to two and a half months. And, uh, uh, and, you, and at that point, the bees sometimes will even uh, chew them all out. Um, do what, if you're feeding pollen sub, don't let the sub touch the acid pad because the bees don't like the taste of the acid. Now, the other thing we do, if you have a high mite colony, um, you may also, uh, we've, we've experimented by putting in a formic, put in the extended release oxalic acid and simultaneously a formic treatment or a time off treatment. So you get the rapid knockdown with the formic or the time off, team off and then you have the extended release that then follows up. Again, none of these are approved. <laughs> um, now, if you're interested in details, at my website, Scientific Beekeeping, homepage, go right down here, how to use it. You don't have to email me all the, if you have an experimental use permit, it's legal for you to do it. That's all the details for researchers of what we've learned right there, how to apply, okay? And the big take home now on my manager, don't make the same mistake that you use over and over again, where you find one treatment you like and you just keep using that treatment. Now you put yourself into a selective breeding program, not for the bees, but for the mites. You keep putting the same treatment in over and over, you're selectively breeding for mites that exhibit resistance to that particular mode of action. So rotate your modes of action. We, we do three different modes of action every season. We do formic acid, oxalic acid twice, and then uh, timol also. So we, we are rotating our treatments. That makes it very difficult for the mites to evolve resistance. And you, if you want, you can put amateur acid in that rotation, but it's not necessary. And I think I'm going to stop here because now we get into the exciting stuff. <laughs> To answer that, so tell you what, here's the teaser for you. First question. 
how safe is oxidic acid with the glycerin for the bees? Uh, what, why and how does it affect the mites? Open question. What's the optimal dose? How long does it continue to affect the mites? I can tell you right now, 70 days or more it, it, uh, for full efficacy. Big question. So you put in these sponges, and you have in there for 70 days, does the acid, are you acidifying the hive? Does the acid residue build up? I'm going to show you this afternoon what actually happens. And why do you have differences in efficacy between the vaporization, the dribble, and the extended release? And we will show you the data of, to answer those questions. And when we come back to the afternoon, we'll dive into the hard data.